So you say your protagonist doesn't have a pulse. Are they dead or only mostly dead? That's what we are discussing today on the Fight Right Podcast. I am your host, Carla Hoke. Okay, if you follow my blog at Fight Right, one word, F-I-G-H-T-W-R-I-T-E, that is trademarked, by the way, you know who you are. You know that we are uh, in the middle of a series on what happens at a death scene from 911 to the morgue. This last post was about the chain of events that happen from dispatch to the time that um, EMS arrives. If you are a mystery, thriller, crime writer, or the ilk, and have, or you just have violent crime in a medical scene or a rando dead body in your work, both this podcast series and the blog are going to be great for you. For the next few episodes of the Fight Right podcast, we will be going over stages of death and decomposition. If you eat lunch while you listen, consider yourself warned, although this episode shouldn't be too bad. If you have my book, Fight Right, two different words, uh, F-I-G-H-T, new word, W-R-I-T-E, how to write believable fight scenes out with Writer's Digest, much of what I'm going to uh, talk about in the next few podcasts is in round five, chapter 33. By the way, you can buy my book at just about all bookstores and, of course, online. Thank you, Amazon UK. I do love you. And if you have read the book, please leave a review on Goodreads and Amazon. You do not have to have bought a book from Amazon to leave a review there, by the way. Okay, stages of decomposition. Here we go. Sort of. Um, By the way, I lack three credit hours from being able to teach secondary biology. Um... I'm glad that an almost degree isn't going to waste here today. There's a heap of biology talk in the next few episodes, and I don't mean to brag, but I can say almost all the science words that I've got to say. All right, before the body starts to dispose of itself in decomposition, it has to die first. And there really are stages of death. Not all death is the same, and there is dead and kind of dead and mostly dead. There's clinical death and biological death. Clinical death is the cessation of circulating blood and respiration. Um, This is possibly treatable through defibrillation, and paramedics um, will also give a shot of epinephrine as well. When you see doctors put paddles on somebody's chest and yell clear, they are defibrillating uh, with an electronic pulse. It's called defibrillation because it treats fibrillation. Fibrillation is a quivering movement due to um, uncoordinated contraction in the individual muscle fibers. Um, All the tiny little muscle fibers, this is something that's unique to the heart muscles in the body, they uh, beat in sync with each other. They work in sync. And if you actually cut off a little sliver of heart muscle from a live functioning heart and put it on a plate, that little sliver of muscle will actually beat. If you cut off another tiny little sliver of muscle and put it beside it, they may have different beat rhythms, but if you let them touch, they will sync up. Now, notice that um, I said clinical death is the cessation of circulating blood and respiration. That doesn't necessarily mean the heart is no longer active. In fibrillation, also known as V-fib, is just that the heart isn't working together well enough to pump blood and do its job. VTAC, as in tachycardia, is when the heart pumps too quickly. Um, In VTAC, the contractions are so rapid that there's not enough time for the heart to refill with blood, which creates an undetectable pulse. So no pulse doesn't necessarily mean the heart is stopped. It could be that the heart is in VFib or VTAC. Uh, which just means the heart isn't working in a way that allows a pulse to be detected. An AED, or an automatic electronic, see I told you I could say almost all the words, automatic electronic defibrillator will uh, get the heart rhythm in order. It's not the same in CPR. Well, the hope is that it will get it in order. It doesn't always. Okay, the purpose of CPR is to circulate blood so it can provide oxygen to the body and the brain and the other organs and keep them um, alive and as healthy as you can until an ambulance arrives. If you have a character who is in VTAC or VFib, having another character perform CPR 
isn't the optimal course of treatment. Um, a defibrillator is best. However, if the two characters are away from medical assistance, CPR absolutely should happen because there won't be a pulse, which means the body isn't getting the O2 it needs. It doesn't mean that the heart's not working. It just means it's not working in a way that allows perfusion or it gets enough blood and oxygen to the body. CPR is not generally, generally, not always, not generally going to regulate a heart or restart its function. It can revive a person in a couple ways. Um, in the case of drowning, uh, CPR can get enough oxygen to the brain and heart that the body kind of wakes up a bit and the gag reflex happens and it or and they cough and they get some of the water out. Um, it can be that CPR just uh, pushes enough O2 to the brain that it restarts the heart if the heart has in fact stopped momentarily. However, CPR doesn't work the way American hospital dramas depict. And and I mean, as writers, that's some something we generally, not generally, we sometimes turn to for um, resources in our writing. There was a study by Princess of Wales Hospital in the UK about the success of CPR on a couple uh, TV medical dramas in the U.S. And they specified U.S. because the percentages here were different than um, hospital dramas in the U.K. They noted that the patient survival rate in U.S. hospital dramas after CPR was about 70%. And it very seldom showed um, the patient leaving the hospital afterward. This was much higher than it was depicted in the British show. CPR in uh, UK medical dramas doesn't work as well as it does in American medical dramas. In reality, um, CPR, about 40% of patients survive immediately after being resuscitated. But only 10 to 20% of those survive long enough to leave the hospital. Something that also isn't shown, I, I mentioned this earlier, is that patients are also uh, given shots of epinephrine during the CPR cycle to kind of jumpstart the system. That definitely impacts the immediate survival rate. By the way, before I did this broadcast, I contacted my friend, Dr. Jason Joyner, who is a physician's assistant, and he was the fellow who went through um, the medical portion of my Fight Right book and made sure that it was all correct. So I did talk to him about this. And unless I'm screwing up completely what he said, this is mainly, mostly, sort of, pretty much correct. Pretty sure. My, my whole point with a CPR thing is that it isn't um, the magic fix that the screen and pages would have you believe it is. If the heart has stopped completely, you got nothing. Uh, CPR, meaning... There's no VTAC, there's no VFib, there's just, well, even if there is, CPR helps sustain the body tissues until medical help arrives. That's its purpose. If it happens to, you know, bring the person back, great, but that's not the purpose of CPR. By the way, if you still think you're supposed to breathe in somebody's mouth to do CPR, you need to stop this podcast and YouTube it pretty quick. Yes, you really do compressions to the tune, uh, to the beat of the tune, staying alive. The office taught us well. But um, the days of breathing in a person's mouth are over. They have found that there's, there is enough oxygen already in the blood that the chest compressions are more productive than if you stop those chest compressions and breathe in the person's mouth. Um, when I taught high school, I was a coach and I had to be CPR certified. And whenever I went places with my athletes, I had to carry a little mouth shield thingy in case I did have to perform CPR on somebody. And the mouth shield was there, so hopefully it would catch any vomit the person might expel um, during the course of CPR and it not get in my mouth, which is really gross. People may throw up when undergoing CPR. The compressions uh, build up pressure in the body and it can force out stomach contents. Um, if you are performing CPR, if your character, again, this is not medical advice for any human on the planet. I hold myself harmless here. I am not giving this as medical advice for humans. Simply characters in our works in progress. Okay, if your character is performing CPR on another person, it is also quite pl plausible for them to break the ribs 
of the person on whom they're doing CPR. And of course, bruising, absolutely possible. Um, it's also really important to note that performing CPR is exhausting. EMS1.com reported that after only 90 seconds, the quality of chest compressions lowers. The person doing, uh, performing the chest compressions maintained the same speed, but the compressions just weren't as good, just weren't as productive. All right, if uh, your character uses one of the AED wall units that you see in the airport or, you know, maybe wherever they work on someone who has passed out and seemingly has no pulse, um, that little AED machine is super user-friendly. From the time you open the box, it starts talking to you and it tells, uh, tells you what to do, tells you where to put the little um, pads to deliver the shock, and it also tells everyone to stand clear. If you are touching the victim and an, a defibrillator shock is given to them, yes, it can shock you. And the fear is there that the shock would cause the person who is incidentally touching, it would cause their heart to stop. And because that's the possibility, you don't have very many studies on that because in order to do a study, somebody's got to volunteer to possibly have their heart stopped. Actually, you know, I was talking to Dr. Joyner and he said there are some cases where they do shock the body to stop a person's heart uh, to get it to kind of reset itself. I asked him if it was kind of like slapping the heart across the face to tell it to get its act together. He said, yeah, that's, that's kind of a way to put it. Um, and when they stop the person's heart, they're, they're totally lucid and awake and they kind of feel it. That's the strangest thing on the planet. When you do deliver a shock from the defibrillator, the person isn't going to shake and jump all over like Frankenstein's monster taking a lightning strike. Um, the chest bounces a little bit and the shoulders kind of jump, but it's not this dramatic, you know, fish on the dry dock display. By the way, if there is no electrical activity in the heart, the AED will not deliver a shock. If it doesn't detect a rhythm or any electricity, it will not deliver the shock. By the way, by the way, EKG machines, you know, where it shows the little blip of the person's heartbeat and it shows whether there's flatlining or not, they're not 100% accurate. Flatline doesn't mean that your character is dead. They just may be mostly dead. So you can't trust that 100%. Okay, clinical death is the cessation of circulating blood and respiration. Um, there is still brain function in these first stages of clinical death. And it's in these first stages that people have out-of-body experiences. And those are absolutely real. I have a friend that um, died on the operating table and had an out-of-body experience. You can read about that in my book. Um, she's fine. I saw her today. Um, in clinical death, patients report hearing what is said about them as well. That could be a really cool twist in your story. How are we on time? We're doing pretty good. Okay, biological death. When an individual has sustained either irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem, that person is biologically dead. There is no coming back from biological death. Yes, machines can be used to sustain life in that person, but the person will not be mentally present. Um, the term you hear sometimes, which I absolutely loathe and find to be very disrespectful, is vegetable or in a vegetative state. I hate that term. I hate that. I, I think it's very disrespectful to humans and also vegetables. I love vegetables. Um, that's just me. Yes, I teach how to write fight scenes which kill characters off and may put them into biological death. And I do that in part because I do respect humans. I think writers bear the onus of getting it right and showing the physical and emotional and biological repercussions of violent acts. Um, you know, I've actually, um, something was kind of said to me today. I, I think people have this idea that I'm numb to violence or I don't take it seriously in some way, and I'm not numb to it, and I do take it seriously. That is why I teach self-defense classes. And I personally am, am not a violent person, a zero at all. I even hardly have a temper. I should go to anger management classes to learn how to get angry more often. Um, I recently uh, told a friend of mine who isn't familiar with my writing that I actually 
write kind of dark, violent stuff. And they just laughed and laughed. And they said, knowing me, they just couldn't imagine how I could write that. When you are writing a fight scene or a scene of violence, you have to remember that you are inflicting these acts on a human. Yes, it is fic- a fictional human, but you want your reader to see that character as a living, breathing entity. So you should treat them as such and give them the respect a human being deserves. Okay, that means you need to show the repercussions of um, violent acts upon this. I don't know if you know this, but the difference in a gunshot wound in a PG and PG-13 movies is blood. In a PG movie, you can show somebody getting shot, but you can't show the blood. PG-13, you can show the blood. Now, you tell me which is more respectful and more responsible. I think showing the blood. Otherwise, you're just showing how you can put a hole in somebody and you're not giving the actual repercussions of what is taking place there. If you are killing off a character simply to go on to the next scene, if you're not really showing any repercussions associated with that, I'm not really sure you're doing your job as a writer. And I'm probably going to get emails about that. That's not to say if you have an epic battle scene that you need to go through the mental processes of every single person that does killing or is killed. However, I do think you have the responsibility of depicting the horror of that situation and maybe the aftermath of it that comes in the form of PTSD or or the like. Okay, soapbox dismantled. It's a short soapbox um, and it's a good thing because you know what? My time is running out. On the next episode, we will talk about, for reals, the stages of decomposition, which is way more mega gross than I knew, but also way more mega cool than I knew because God made the human body a self-disposing piece of equipment. It is very awesome. Okay, folks, stop by my blog at fightright.net. You can catch me outside on Twitter at Carla Hoke, C-A-R-L-A-H-O-C-H. You can also hashtag fightright on Twitter and do the same on Instagram, hashtag fightright, and check out my book, Fight Right, How to Write Believable Fight Scenes. Um, You can check out the table of contents on Amazon, by the way. I think you'll be surprised at what's in it. It's not just how to show your characters how to punch each other. There's a lot more to it because you know what? There's a lot more to fighting than just punching. That is all for this episode of the Fight Right podcast. I think we've done a lot of good here today. Until the next round, get blood on your pages. (laughs) 